bound my shackles of this earth. From the dust I was created. To the dust I will return. For a glorious resurrection. Restored and raised to life, recreated in your presence. You may dust your grand design, you may dust your grand Come on, church, from wherever you are today, let's put our hands together and praise Him. Here we go. Good morning, church. It is wonderful to be with you guys this morning. Thank you so much for joining us online. 
Uh, if, if this is your first time with us, please remember to drop us a line. Let us know who you are. We want to get to know you just a little bit better. And we're just grateful that you were able to find us. And uh, we just want to give God some praise this morning and praise and worship and just show him how much we love him, that the things that he has for us as a church and as a people is, is just a wonderful things to come. And uh, he's faithful in that. So let's go ahead. Oh, amen. Let's give him some worship this morning.
you, God, for being not only the cornerstone of our faith, but of our life. God, God, we know the importance and the strength that that cornerstone holds, God. And what happens when you pull it away, Lord? And we're grateful that we can depend on the rock that is you, God, to always be there, Lord. To be our father, to be our best friend, to be our cornerstone, God. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Communion is just so interesting. I want to jump into the scripture and see how Jesus started it. I want to see what he was thinking and feeling when he started the very first communion. Matthew 26, 26. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day that when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, before we take the elements, I just want to point out this one sentence. It won't take long. But the context is Jesus was having dinner with his friends. He wasn't in a formal church setting at the right place in the right time. And Jesus was reclining at the dinner table with his beloved friends. This wasn't a perfect moment by our standards, how we think of church. This was Jesus loving people where they were. No matter how much they understood him or not, he was inviting his cl closest friends. And today Jesus invites us, his closest friends, um, all of you are his closest friends, and we are your closest friends to communion. So grab your elements and we'll take it together. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So let's drink this uh, communion juice today, and in the future we will drink it with Jesus in person. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, my dear friends. Well, good morning. I want to welcome you to week 10 in our Summer on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount series, and we're looking forward to this this morning. What we're going to talk about today is all of my stuff. Now, we started this Sermon on the Mount series back in June, and here we are in August, and we still have a ways to go. So much to unpack, so much to learn still. So today we're going to focus on three little verses in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. And as if I told you this in previous weeks, 
It may be uncomfortable at times because I'm going to talk about all of our stuff and how we view all of our possessions, including our money. Now, it would be easy for me to sit here and tell you how grateful I am. But if you saw my family's Amazon account, it would look more like a cart full instead of being grateful. Anybody else get packages from Amazon and it feels like Christmas for you? Because you have to wait until you open them to know what it is. I'll come home at lunch and there'll be three or four packages on the steps some days. We live in a world where we are bombarded with stuff. I mean, just talk to someone about a pair of shoes you like, and the next time you open up your Facebook or your Instagram, there's an ad for them right there. There are catalogs and TV commercials and Google searches and YouTube ads everywhere you turn. And I'm guilty. I see something and I say, wow, that is, that is really cool. I wonder how much that would cost. I wonder how soon I could get it. And with all these ads, I soon figure out that my watch isn't quite cool enough or I don't drive the right kind of car or I don't have the best fishing and hunting equipment. And hey, I can actually make french fries with air. If I had a phone with all the latest technology, I could even learn more about the things that I don't have. I mean, wow, it just goes on and on. And I begin to believe that everybody has all of this stuff but me. So we become dissatisfied with what we have and what we can't have because we can't afford it, maybe. We have food and we have clothes and we have transportation and we have music to stream and we have flatter TVs and smarter than ever phones. But the world will tell you that this stuff all needs to be upgraded. I know it sounds hard to believe, but people used to use things actually until they broke or wore out. I know that's a crazy thought today, isn't it? There's a whole generation here that's never done that. Here's another thing that when we broke, they would fix them. I mean, that sounds stupid today, right, to some people. The great thing now is that something breaks, we just throw it out and we get a new one. But I grew up in a small town with not a lot of money, and you would just improvise if something breaks. We'd try and replace it with something we already had, or we used to say you could fix anything with duct tape and bailing wire. If it's loose, you, you tighten it up with duct tape. If it's too tight, you spray some WD-40 on it. Well, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 says, Don't store up treasures here on heaven or here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Well, what does that really mean here? Treasures on earth. Well, this passage is a giant neon light pointing right to the things that we've been talking about already today. Our desire is an appetite. And if you feed that, what happens? It grows. It doesn't go away. We eat a big meal and we stand up and we say things like, I couldn't eat another bite. But give me a few hours and my head's going to be in the refrigerator. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here either. The problem isn't Amazon or marketing. So if you're in that business, don't worry. I'm not telling you what you're doing is wrong. But there is something to be said about storing up treasure on earth. Like credit card debt. Not having enough savings to take care of your needs because you've got so much stuff sitting all around your house. And we get caught up in more stuff, we lose our financial margin. You see, peace is always found in the margin. And in reality, when there is no margin, there's no generosity. Because you, I've got so much stuff, there's so much more stuff that I'm trying to get, there's no room to give away. I believe that's exactly what Jesus was talking about here in verse 19, where he says, don't store up treasures here on earth. So what did Jesus mean about moths and rust? Well, some of you remember that we actually used to use mothballs to keep bugs from eating our clothes that lined our closets, right? Or then we would put inside the closets cedar wood because bugs don't like cedar. And we all know that what rust can do to things. But I think what Jesus was saying, that he meant that the things that earth are fleeting or short-term, Either something's going to eat them up, or maybe someone will even steal them. Someday, that car you love so much and spend so much time washing and waxing, someday it'll be in a junkyard. That house that you love, that maybe you raised your kids in, you have so many great memories in it, it's going to fall down or be pushed down someday. And all our stuff that we love so much, our kids or someone else will pick through it someday, and some of it will throw out, some of it they'll keep. Because the things of this world are fleeting, and someday they're all going to be gone. 
Now, all stuff is not bad. Many people spend their lives creating stuff that makes life better for other people. I mean, think about transportation. Just think about what life would be like without planes and trains and cars and roads to drive on. People see a need in Africa for water pumps and how to create seeds that grow in any kind of climate. People invent water purifiers and medicines and machines that save lives. We are the enemy, not the stuff. The stuff is not the problem here this morning. We are. We're discontent. So how do, we, how do we reel that in? How do we tame it? You tame discontentment not by deciding from now on I'm not going to be discontent. It's not by deciding from now on I'm simply going to be content with what I have. It's not that simple. No, you replace it with something better. And when you do that, that's when you truly discover life. So let's take a look at verse 20 where it says, Store your treasures in heaven where moss and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. What does it mean to store up treasures in heaven? First of all, I remind you again that these are, these are the words of Jesus here. And to store up treasure in heaven, we have, to, well, we have to model him. We have to be like him. Well, how do we do that exactly? I think that one of the best ways that we can do that is to make sure that we put other people above our stuff. That's what Jesus was all about when he took over 600 laws, 613 to be exact, and he boiled them all down to one, right? I mean, one important, we all know what it is. Love one another as I have loved you. So how did God love us? Well, we know for starters that he gave Jesus to die for us, right? But for me, the thing that set Jesus apart from everyone is that he always moved towards the mess, right? No matter what it was. And when we, as a people, we move toward the mess and put someone above ourselves, that's when you start to store treasures up in heaven. Godliness is not about staying away from people who are ungodly. It's about engaging with other people in a way that helps other people. You see, when you put other people first, you start to say, I'm okay with what I have. Becoming a parent for the first time many times gives you a very big taste of what that feels like. It forces you to think of someone else first. You know, none of us, none of us brought anything into this world with us. What does that have to do with anything, you might ask? Well, in other words, we were perfectly content before we got here. Do you remember that? No, you don't. Do you? Of course you don't. You weren't here. But get this, you were the most lovable when you owned nothing. I mean, think about your own children or think about other people's children when they were babies, even somebody else's baby, how lovable they are. You're the most cherished before you ever owned anything. And this is a subtle way of saying that you have value way beyond what you have. So to grow up and somehow measure your value by the things that you own is a mistake. Because you brought nothing into this world, and we all know this, you, you can't take anything out of it when it comes to money or your stuff. You're not leaving with anything, in fact. You're leaving everything behind. So here's the question that I want you to think about today. Other than stuff, what will you leave behind? Because we've established that you will leave your stuff behind. It's the old saying that you've heard before, you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul, do you? But when you leave, other than your stuff, what will you leave behind? We need to learn to keep this front and center in our mind. What will your legacy be? Only you can write it and no one can do it for you. Do you want to leave behind the treasures of earth or do you want to store up treasures in heaven? I want you to think about the person or the people that have really shaped you into the follower of Christ that you have become. There may be many of them, a parent, a grandparent, a loving Sunday school teacher, a preacher, a youth minister. Maybe it was simply a good friend. And because they loved Jesus first, their care for you shined through everything else. They loved you like Jesus does, and they shared themselves with you. You were able to see in real life what following God really means to a person, and you admired them for their devotion and their example. 
Now, do you imagine that this particular person that you're thinking of spent a lot of time worrying about their stuff? You know, I can't imagine someone with a heart like that worrying that they don't have the latest iPhone or making sure that the latest fashion trends are making their way into their closet. This sounds much more like a person who knows what it means to be storing up treasures in heaven. The Apostle Paul talks about this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. He says, But godliness with contentment is a great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. So here, he was talking to his traveling companions, Timothy, Luke, Barnabas, and some others. And he said, if we have food and clothing, we're going to be, we're going to be all right. We're going to be content with that. And his life, Paul's life, was always in danger. I mean, he was stoned. He was shipwrecked. He was bitten by poisonous snakes. And he knew any day his life could end. And he said, I'm not asking you to take it to that extreme, to the extreme that I've taken it to. But I just want you to know that I'm practicing what I'm preaching here. And I know what I'm talking about. Which leads us to another question. What did the Apostle Paul leave behind? How did that work for him, just having food and clothes to wear? So what did he leave behind? Well, he left behind letters that shaped Western culture for 2,000 years. Wow. Paul says, I don't have any stuff. I don't, I don't have anything to leave behind. I think I'll just help shape the world for the next 2,000 years. He left behind a theology that would disrupt the Roman Empire. He left behind a string of churches around the Mediterranean Rim that shaped now the church would be done for Gentiles for most of 300 years. Paul just said, if I want great gain, if I want to store up treasure in heaven, you have to take your mind off the stuff of this world. And church, to be honest, there's really nothing wrong with most stuff. But the problem is you'll get to the end of your life and there's nothing left but stuff. It's not bad. It's not morally wrong. It's not sin. It's just don't you want to leave something behind that's not a thing? Don't you want more? If something happened to you or something happened to me, what would be left behind? Is it about money and how much you can pile up? I mean, is money your priority? Because we know, we've said this before, there's nothing wrong with money. The problem is with us that we want more money so we can get more stuff, so we can be content but will we really be? The problem is we want more money and then we begin to isolate ourselves from others, including our family, because we think that all they want is our money. Money and the love of it is a trap. And you say, you say I can win the lottery and I would be fine because I can handle that sort of wealth. Other people can't do it, but I can. But you never, you've never been caught in a trap, have you? You see, there's a reason they're called traps. It's because if you knew they were there, no one would step in them. So how do you know if you love money? Because I've never really met anyone who said, I think my problem is that I love money. And that's why it's a trap. No, we wouldn't say, I love money. No, we'd probably just say, I I'm just careful. I'm, I'm ambitious. We have many different ways to describe it. Our passage today, we're still in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 says, Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So how do we know if we love money and if that's our treasure? Well, here are a few things to get us started. What are you willing to do for it? I mean, you're willing to do crazy things for what you love, correct? Remember when you fell in love and you, maybe you drove all night to see her? Or you snuck out of the house late at night to see him? You wasted all this money on some silly thing that he wanted or she wanted, and you didn't care about what it cost. See, when we love something, we go to extremes. So what are you willing to do for money? More importantly, who are you willing to hurt for it? Is there someone at home who feels like they're competing for you for your time with your stuff or competing with your stuff and your money? Is there someone at home that you tell, well, I just wanted to make sure that you're taken care of when I'm gone. But in truth, here's what your wife and kids are thinking. We just wish you'd go ahead and be gone because you're not here anyway. If you're not here and you're not going to love us or be a good father or husband, then why don't you just go ahead and go? 
They just don't believe you anymore because you like being gone. Your wife and kids can't compete with this, and it really means is that you love something else more than your family. The love of money and stuff can change any of us, and it's a terrible, terrible trap. Houses, cars, boats, trucks to pull boats, more stuff until there's just, really there's not any room for God anymore. So how do we escape? We can't just say, no, I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do that. Because first we have to become aware of the problem and recognize it for what it is. Our priorities are all out of whack. You always have to give something up to get something better. Now I have to freely admit to you right here this morning that everything that God has taken away from me has claw marks on it from where he pulled it. But we have to remind ourselves that the things of this world are fleeting. To store up things here is futile, and someday it'll all be gone. But when we store things up in heaven, when we store treasures in heaven, that's eternal stuff, church. And when it comes there, it becomes a treasure. The best stuff that the world has to offer us, we're told, is gold. And in heaven, guess what it is? It's asphalt in heaven. As we've stated before, stuff and money, that's not a sin. It's a great thing if you can accumulate some of it to, by working hard and giving your family things they need and want. It's when we make it our God that it becomes a big problem. And God is saying, I want you to have stuff. I just don't want your stuff to have you. People should say, she has a lot, man, but she does a lot for people. Or he has a lot, but he always has time for other people. And here it is, and I get this. If you have more, then you need to do more. You need to give more. Over the last 25 years or so, I've done my share of counseling, both in the church and in my capacity as a mental health worker. And I've helped people walk through the problems of life. Along the way, I've learned some pretty simple facts, things like focusing on the things that you can change and turning the mind away from other things that you can't change. Well, this morning, I'm going to ask you three questions that I want you to answer for yourself. And these answers, they're just for you. And if you're honest with yourself, then you'll start to see where your priorities lay and where your treasure is. Number one, how do I spend my time? Now, I'm not talking about working hours or things that you have to do at home. I'm talking about the time that is yours to spend any way that you choose. Do I spend it on me, family? You can play golf or go fishing or go for a drive, have a drink, volunteer at a food bank or community services, mentor somebody at a homeless shelter or something like that, have a cup of coffee with somebody. You decide because it's your time. How do I spend my money? Once again, the money you use to pay the house payment or monthly bill, that's not what we're talking about here. The money that you spend wherever you want it. This would be your extra income. Some of you are saying, well, I don't even know what that sounds like or what that is. Do you spend what you have on me, money that you can buy more stuff with, or do you help your neighbor who's struggling to pay the light bill or doesn't have enough food to eat? You decide because it's your money. And third, what do I think about? And this might be the most telling of all, really, me. I may not be much, but I'm, I'm darn near all I ever think about. Do I think about treasures here on earth or do I think about treasure in heaven? What occupies your mind? Would embarrass you to tell someone else, or maybe you can't wait to tell someone about the great cause that you're thinking about that, that could change your community or the world? Truth of it is this, church. We're all going to die someday. People are going to show up, stand around our grave, throw some dirt on us, and go back to the church and have potato salad. The question is, what do I want them to say about me? What did I live for? Was it my stuff? Tony Campolo asked it this way, do you want to live for a title or for a testimony? See, because I see a title as stuff, president, CEO, PhD, chairman, nothing wrong with any of those things, but is that what I live for? When, are they, when I die, are they going to stand around my grave and talk about my titles, counselor, teacher, coach, pastor? 
Or are they going to stand around my grave and tell stories about how I made a difference in their lives for Christ? I mean, ultimately, isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we should all want? Do you have your stuff or does your stuff have you? Because the value of a life is always determined by what you gave away, not by what you accumulated. When you leave, I hope you leave behind more than things. I hope your story is that people know the story of Jesus because of you. What is your treasure? Because only you can write the rest of your story. Let's pray. Father God, we just are so humbled by the way that you've gifted and blessed us. Everyone hearing this is blessed in some way. And Lord, we just pray this morning that we will learn to appreciate that. We'd learn to live with what we have. We'd learn to be content with what we've been gifted with. And Lord, we also pray for those of us that, that have been gifted with so much, Lord, that you would give us hearts that were worthy of Jesus, who would help those in need, who would make sure that those around them were taken care of. Lord, we're not talking about trying to make people feel guilty for being successful. No, that's not it. I think you applaud our success, but Lord, we just want to make sure that we are doing the best we can with what we have to serve your kingdom. And Lord, we just pray there'd be a church of people that, that are looking out just like that. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week for week 11 in this Summer on the Mount series. See you next time.